In this video I'll be going through the 2022 Mechanical Systems paper. Question 1. Some children are playing on a roundabout. Riley pushes the roundabout and gets it spinning at a constant angular speed. It makes one revolution in 1.23 seconds. Show that the angular velocity of the roundabout is 5.11 radians per second. The value that we're given here is our period. And from our formula sheet, we know that the equation for angular velocity is 2 pi f. We also know that the frequency is 1 over period, so that we can also write 2 pi 1 over t or just 2 pi over t. Putting our period in, gives me 5.11 radians per second to three significant figures. Riley stops pushing, and 30 seconds later, the roundabout has slowed, so that it takes 2.04 seconds to make one revolution. The roundabout can be approximated to a spinning disc with a rotational inertia of 57.6 kg meter square. Determine the average angular deceleration of the roundabout as it slows, and calculate the average frictional torque acting on the roundabout as it slows. So our 30 seconds is our time, and 2.04 is our period finally. So in a time of 30 seconds, we go from an initial angular velocity of 5.11 radians per second, which is what we showed above, to a final velocity, which knowing the final period, we can use this equation here again to find. And I get 3.08 radians per second to three significant figures. Our angular deceleration is just our change in angular velocity divided by the duration over which it changed, which is our final minus initial divided by our time. Putting those numbers in, gives me negative 0.0677 radians per second per second. Our value is negative because our angular velocity is decreasing. Now to find the average frictional torque which is producing this angular deceleration. We can relate our torque, angular acceleration and rotational inertia using this equation here, where we have both of these values. Which gives me 3.90 newton meters to three significant figures. Four friends all ride on the roundabout in the positions shown in the diagram. Explain using physics principles what the friends can do to make the roundabout speed up while staying on the platform. Exclude all influences external to the platform. So to make our angular velocity speed up, and using the fact that we're excluding all influences external to the platform, that means that our angular momentum remains unchanged. We know that angular momentum is I omega, so in order to increase our angular velocity, we need to decrease our rotational inertia. Now, rotational inertia is always proportional to mr squared, and so if we want to decrease this rotational inertia, where we know the mass must stay the same, that means we must reduce our radius. Or in other words, our four friends must move towards the middle. Excluding external influences means angular momentum remains constant. Since angular momentum is rotational inertia times angular velocity, to increase angular velocity we must decrease the rotational inertia. This can be done by reducing the radius at which the mass is positioned. For example, the friends could move towards the middle. Matilda wants to run and jump onto the initially stationary roundabout, holding onto poles at A or B to make it spin as fast as possible. She tries different jumps onto the roundabout. Assuming that she will always jump at the same speed, explain which jump, jump A or jump B, will make the roundabout go faster. And so when Matilda jumps onto the roundabout, the component of her force which will produce a torque that will angrily accelerate the roundabout is the component that will be perpendicular to the radius. So if she jumps at A with a certain force, all of that force is perpendicular to the radius, and so all of that force will produce a rotational torque. Whereas if she jumps on at B, a smaller amount of that force is going to go into rotating the roundabout, because less of that force is perpendicular to the radius. Only the component of force perpendicular to the radius will rotate the roundabout. This component is greater at A, so the largest torque and therefore rotational velocity will occur.
Matilda subsequently lets go of the pole and slips off the roundabout. Discuss the possible effects on the speed of the roundabout. Assume there is negligible friction between Matilda and the roundabout. And so right away, because there is negligible friction, we know that Matilda must not have applied a force to the roundabout during this event, and therefore there's no reason the roundabout's rotational velocity would change. Because there is negligible friction, we can assume Matilda does not apply a force to the roundabout. No force means no torque. No torque means the angle of velocity of the roundabout is unaffected. Question 2. Comets and asteroids are loosely formed objects that are easily broken up, especially when they collide. In this scenario, a 1 times 10 to the power of 2 kilogram object, moving with a velocity of 5 times 10 to the 2 meters per second, collides with a stationary 3 times 10 to the 2 kilogram object. Calculate the distance of the center of mass of the system from the 3 times 10 to the 2 kilogram object when the objects are 4 times 10 to the 3 meters apart. Our center of mass equation is this one here. Where we'll make this m1 and this m2. If we imagine our center of mass somewhere here, the distance we're trying to find is this one here. If we were to make this position x equals 0, then this distance would be our x com. What that would mean is that our x2 is equal to 0, and our x1 is equal to this separation. Going back to this equation, because we've decided x2 is 0, this whole term disappears, and we just need to put in our numbers. This here is 100, 500, 300, and 4000. Which gives me 1000 meters. Calculate the gravitational force between the two objects when their centers of mass are 10 meters apart. Assume that the velocity of the masses are constant before the collision. Our equation for our gravitational force is this one here. Where our 10 meters is our r, our m1 and m2 are our respective masses, and big G is the universal gravitational constant. So we just need to put those numbers in which gives me 2.00 times 10 to the negative 8 newtons, two three significant figures. Hence find the acceleration of the 1 times 10 to the 2 kilogram object at this separation to determine whether the assumption that their velocities are constant before the collision is valid. Knowing the force and knowing the mass, we can use the fact that force equals mass times acceleration, and that acceleration is equal to force divided by mass, and put our numbers in which gives me 2.00 times 10 to the minus 10 meters per second per second. This acceleration is very small, so the assumption is valid. The objects collide with no external forces and form two rocks, A and B, each with a mass of 2 times 10 to the 2 kilograms. These move away from each other, as shown in the diagram, in directions at 20 degrees, either side of the initial direction of the impacting rock. Show that the size of the momentum of rocks A and B are the same, even though they are in different directions. You may use the space below to draw vector diagrams. This is a tough question to know exactly how to approach, but what it boils down to is they want you to show a knowledge of conservation of momentum. We can say that because momentum is conserved, the vertical components must equal, meaning this component here, which recognizing that this is a right angle triangle, and that this is our hypotenuse, which is our total momentum, and that this is our opposite. Via Sokotoa, we have the so relationship, which is that sine of our angle, which in this case is 20 degrees, is equal to our opposite divided by our hypotenuse, where as mentioned, our hypotenuse is P. Solving that for O gives us P sine 20. So our PA vertically must equal our PB vertically, which equals PA sine 20 and PB sine 20. Dividing both sides by sine 20 gives us that PA equals PB. Calculate the speed of the rocks A and B. You may use the space below to draw vector diagrams. Begin your answer by calculating the total momentum before collision. And so first of all, our momentum before because this is stationary, is going to entirely come from this object here. Specifically, its mass of 100 kilograms multiplied by its velocity of 500 meters per second. 
which gives me 50,000 kilogram meters per second. Now we know that our momentum before is going to equal our momentum afterwards. Our momentum afterwards comes from our rock A and our rock B, both of which are at 20 degrees to our before. Now because we already have established that PA is equal to PB, we know that this picture is symmetrical, such that this side here is just P before divided by 2. Now recognizing that this is a right angle, making this our adjacent side and this our hypotenuse, we can use the trigonometric relationship that cosine of our angle, which is 20 degrees, is equal to our adjacent over hypotenuse, or P before over 2, divided by PA. Solving this for PA by multiplying both sides by PA, which I'll continue down here, and now dividing both sides by cosine 20, putting in our momentum before, giving me 2.66 times 10 to the 4 kilogram meters per second. Recognizing that our momentum is mass times velocity, and that we're, after all, trying to find our speed or our velocity, and remembering that the mass of our rocks is now 200 kilograms, we can solve this for velocity, and put our numbers in giving me 133 meters per second to three significant figures. And so just to be clear, that is both our velocity of A and also our velocity of B. Question three. Some space explorers on Mars want to check that their electronic timers are functioning correctly. They make a simple pendulum using a large rock of mass 2.3 kilograms tied to a wire. The distance from the center of mass of the rock to the fixing point is 1.83 meters. On Mars, the gravitational field strength is 3.72 newtons per kilogram. Show that the time period of the pendulum is 4.41 seconds. The equation for the period of a pendulum is this one here where L is our distance here, and G is our acceleration due to gravity. Putting those numbers in, gives me 4.41 seconds to three significant figures, which is what we're trying to find. They set the pendulum oscillating by releasing the pendulum bob 0.3 meters away from its rest position, and at the same moment they start a timer. Determine the position of the pendulum bob from its release point two seconds after it is released. You may use the space above to draw a phasor diagram to help your calculation. We can imagine our pendulum oscillating side to side about this axis, where our equilibrium is in the middle, and the distance from which our pendulum is released is our 0.3 meters here. Our starting position has our vector over here. Upon release, we can imagine it rotating clockwise. Since we know that the period of our pendulum is 4.41 seconds, as we showed in the last question, what we also know is that this is independent of the amplitude, meaning that provided the length of the pendulum and the planet we're on doesn't change, we can expect this to always be true. Now we're wanting to find the position of the pendulum bob two seconds after it's released, having rotated through some particular angle, where our system is starting at its maximum displacement. For that reason, we're going to use the cosine equation for the distance. Where our amplitude is at 0.3 meters, our time is at two seconds, but we don't yet know our omega. The equation for omega is 2 pi f, or since we know the period, and that frequency is 1 over the period, we could also write 2 pi divided by the period. Putting our period in, gives me 1.42 radians per second. Putting that into our equation, gives me negative 0.286. Now, since it takes 4.41 seconds for our phaser to complete an entire cycle, that means to swing all the way to the other side here is going to take half of our period, or roughly 2.2 seconds, meaning that after 2 seconds, our pendulum is going to be somewhere around here. Our negative 286 is giving us this distance here. To find the distance from the release point, we need to add on our 0 0.3. Which gives me 0 0.586 meters to three significant figures. The amplitude of the pendulum decreases from 0.3 meters to 0.2 meters. Explain why the period of the pendulum remains unchanged. 
The equation for period is t equals 2 pi the square root of l over g, the pendulum length l and gravitational acceleration g are constant and unaffected by amplitude, therefore the period is unaffected by changing the amplitude. Calculate the total energy lost when the amplitude decreases from 0.3 meters to 0.2 meters. Begin your answer by calculating the maximum velocity of the bob for the initial and final amplitude. The velocity of a simple harmonic system is described by this equation here. Because the maximum that this term here can be is 1, the maximum our velocity can be is a omega. And so for our case of 0.3 meters, our Vmax is a omega, where our amplitude is 0.3, and our angular frequency is 1.42. Giving me 0.426 meters per second to three significant figures. For our 0.2 amplitude, we can do the same. Giving me 0.284 meters per second to three significant figures. Now, at this position where our velocity is at maximum, all of our energy is kinetic energy. For this reason, this is the total energy. And so our change in our energy, knowing that our kinetic energy is half mv squared, is going to be half mv1 squared minus half mv2 squared. We will call this v1 and this v2. We can factorize out our half m to get this equation here where our mass was mentioned all the way up here as 2.3, and we can put our velocities in, which gives me 0.116 joules to three significant figures. And we're done.